And I would uh, like to uh, invite the next speaker. Please welcome Susan Heller Pinto, Vice President of International Policy in ADL. At her role, Susan Heller Pinto oversees ADL's work combating anti-Semitism and hate outside the United States and supporting Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Susan joined ADL in 1993 as Assistant Director of Middle Eastern Affairs and has worked for nearly three decades to develop and promote ADL's international affairs priorities. Susan, please. Hi, so it's a tough position to be in to go after Professor Dershowitz, so uh, <laughs> um, thank you Reu, thank you INSS, thank you Yossi for inviting me here today. Just a few words about ADL for those of you um, who are unaware, ADL has been around since 1913. We call ourselves the leading anti-hate organization in the world. Um, our mission developed in 1913, and I've been through many focus groups in my many decades at ADL, and we still stay with the same mission from 1913, is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and um, fair treatment to all. And today, ADL continues to fight all forms of anti-Semitism and bias, wherever it happens. In Israel, we have an office in Israel. I'm here with a delegation of ADL leaders. Um, we uh, work to secure a Jewish and democratic state of Israel, leaving, living in peace and security with its neighbors. And outside Israel, we work to educate and engage on the challenges and complexities Israel faces at home and around the world. And here in Israel, we also do our anti-bias work, our anti-hate work, and on Wednesday, we will be having a large conference a couple of miles from here, promoting social cohesion within Israeli society. So I'll, as you've heard from successive, Israeli, uh, successive speakers today, it's a very um, time of heightened awareness and concern about the growth of anti-Semitism in the United States. You've heard references to Saturday Night Live just a couple of days ago, to NBA stars, to um, social media activists, and to very high profile celebrities. And um, we have been speaking out about these trends and we're committed to speaking out about anti-Semitism wherever it happens, whether it's on the right, whether it's on the left, or Islamist anti-Semitism, or anti-Semitism that you can't exactly define um, what the origin is. And one of the trends that we have been talking about very publicly for the last couple of years is the increase in anti-Semitic anti expressions related to rhetoric about Israel and Zionism. And I want to be clear that there's always been extreme rhetoric, extreme opposition um, to Israel, criticism of Israel. Um, but what we've seen in the last couple of years is something very demonstrably different. It's on a greater scale, it's more mainstream, and it's having a direct impact on Jews in the United States. So I want to be clear when I say this, that I'm not talking about differences. I'm not talking about criticism. I'm not talking about critical discourse about the Israeli government, its leaders, or its policies. Um, and there is plenty of criticism, and there's going to be more, depending on what the coalition looks like and depending what policies are implemented, what r rhetoric we see um, regarding Israeli Arabs and other minorities in Israel, about religious pluralism. Um, but even if we disagree with this discourse and this criticism, it's acceptable and it's not in, in uh, democratic society and we don't label that as dangerous or anti-Semitic. What we're seeing is something very different. Um, so these are the trends that we have pulled out from the last couple of years. Um, number one is the mainstream of extremist rhetoric, mainstreaming of extremist rhetoric. Um, labeling Israel, whether it's the term genocide, apartheid, colonial, um, colonialism, racist, just very casually used to label Israel and label Zionists and label um, Zionism as a whole. And we see this from influencers on social media, from celebrities, from public officials, from elected officials. And it creates an understanding and an environment 
um, where it's publicly acceptable to just assume that anything related to Israel is equivalent to evil, equivalent to a form of oppression. I'll show you one of my favorite t-shirts that I used to illustrate this. This was for sale um, at a Netroots conference in 2018 or 2019. Um, and it really illustrates kind of the, the approach to Zionism and to, um, to Israel that even if you're against anti-Semitism, colonialism, sexism, homophobia, everything that you should be opposed to, Zionism is on that list. And through the vilification of anyone associated with Zionism or with Israel, um, anti we see an increase in the use of anti-Semitic tropes about Israel, about Zionism, about Zionists. Um, and uh, whether it's the use of um, references to Jewish power, to dual loyalty, to Jewish money, all in the context of rhetoric and discussion about Israel and Zionism. We also see, and this was referenced from every single speaker, um, because Israel is labeled as evil, because Zionism is a form of oppression, anyone considered associated with that is themselves an oppressor or, their se or themselves unworthy to be in a movement or a form of movement. So we see this general trend of exclusion or ostracism of maybe self-declared Zionists, but also just of Jews. Anyone who is considered somewhat associated with Israel and Zionism, um, excluded from particular movements. I mean, you are familiar with Rashida Tlaib. A couple of weeks ago, she said, you cannot be a progressive and be a Zionist or be pro-Israel. Um, we see that um, uh, a number of years ago, you can't be a feminist and you can't be a Zionist. You can't be an environmentalist and you can't be a Zionist. You can't be against sexual violence and be a Zionist. Um, we see it again and again. The most alarming um, trend that ADL has noted in the last year or so is that uh, as this kind of environment and this rhetoric has grown, the number of documented anti-Semitic incidents or anti-Semitic threats against Jews in the United States has increased. So some of this is from the right, because traditionally on the far, far extreme right, we've seen accusations of Zog, Zionist occupied government, and the use of anti-Semitic tropes to attack Israel, and this has kind of been going on for decades. But more and more, this rhetoric this language is being mimicked by the left and not just the extreme left, more and more mainstream. Um, and it's being tolerated by the center, by the mainstream. Um, you may be familiar with something that ha came out in June called the Mapping Project. This was a, it is a website, it's still online, it's being hosted by an Icelandic company that will not pull it down. Um, and it appeared in June online. It's an interactive map that you can play with that highlights um, community organizations, almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them Jewish, in Massachusetts, where the people who put this up, who just call themselves the Mapping Project, we don't know who they are, they say that these individuals and organizations are responsible for the colonization of Palestine and other perceived harms such as policing, imperialism, and displacement. And this map includes 500 organizations, including Jewish youth groups, including Jewish high schools, um, including arts organizations, including names and addresses. And the Massachusetts Jewish community was terrified when this came out because Somebody, maybe um, somebody looking in it can just say, oh, look, look who's involved in this whole kind of Jewish enterprise or pro-Israel enter enterprise. But for someone intent on doing damage, someone intent on take, taking a violent act, this is a roadmap. It's literally a map um, to attack Jews. And the call to action on this website I'm gonna quote, our goal in pursuing this collective mapping was to reveal the local entities and networks that enact devastation so we can dismantle them. Every entity has an address, every network can be disrupted. 
So I mentioned the increase in threats. The mapping project, I think, is just kind of the most visible one. Um, but ADL, um, as you know, every year, like some, uh, many Jewish um, communities around the world, we collect data on anti-Semitic incidents. And for many, many, and, and the CREF does it, the CST in the UK, they do it in Argentina, um, League for Human Rights does it in Canada. And for many, many years, for decades, whenever there are tensions between Israel and the Palestinians, you saw in Europe an increase in anti-Semitic incidents on attacks on individual Jews, on attacks on Jewish institutions. When tensions rose in the Middle East, you saw an impact in Paris and London, in Buenos Aires and elsewhere. It wasn't so much documented, the case in the United States. That changed in May 2021. Um, in that month, in the kind of the biggest recent um, conflict between Israel and Hamas, um, we saw 387 incidents in the month of May. Um, 297 of those were within the days of the conflict, between May 10th and the end of the month. That represented a 141% increase from, two, from incidents the previous year in 2020, which was during the pandemic, so it was artificially low, but still it was a huge increase, 141%. Um, similarly, okay, I'm sorry, okay. Um, in our audit of anti-Semitic incidents in 2021, um, 345 anti-Semitic incidents involved references to Israel or Zionism, that's throughout the whole war, um, compared to 178 in 2020, a 94% increase. Um, we issued a couple of weeks ago a new report on anti-Israel activism on U.S. campuses. Just to highlight, these are some of the, the breakdowns of anti-Israel um, activity. Many of these incidents uh, may be characterized, not all, but many are, can be characterized as anti-Semitic. But we saw very many trends, which you've heard about a little bit already. One is the exclusion of Jewish students, of, of um, demeaning and ostracizing of those associated with Zionists and Zionism, and an increase in the use of anti-Semitic terminology to talk about Jewish students and to talk about um, pro-Israel students on campus. The last point I wanna make is how are Jews feeling? So a year ago, ADL and Hillel International did a, a survey of Jewish students on campus, and we asked them a series of questions how do you perceive anti-Semitism? Do you experience anti-Semitism and how? Um, I think it's really interesting. 43% of Jewish students that we surveyed said that they had experienced or witnessed anti-Semitic uh, activity in the last year. And here's a word cloud when you ask them what was kind of the nature of the anti-Semitic incident. Israel's not the biggest, but it's quite large on the bottom. So the anti-Semitism they experienced was related to the word, word Israel. Similarly, um, when you asked, are, are you, do you hide your identity or do you self-select um, out of, the, of, of expressing your Jewish identity? Not a lot, not a huge percentage, but 15% of Jewish students reported that they did need to hide their Jewish identity. And from this world, word cloud, you could see Israel was one of the main motivators for why they might hide their Jewish identity. I just want to close with a quote from Jonathan Greenblatt, ADL CEO, who wrote about a year ago in the Washington Post. Right-wing anti-Semitism is the lethal category five, uh, category five hurricane threatening to bring immediate catastrophe. Anti-Semitism on the left, however, is more akin to climate change. Slowly but surely, the temperature is increasing. Often people don't perceive the shift or they choose to ignore it and even in the face of once uncommon storms. But the metaphorical temperature is rising and the conditions threaten to upend life as we know them. Thank you very much.